This is the beginning of an adventure. Strange, you may say, it looks like the end. But watch and see. The Pulau Senang Settlement was an experiment in trying to rehabilitate the civil society members to put them on the island and uh, hopefully rehabilitate them through uh, work. This, then, is the experiment. They start work from scratch, just like pioneers. Pulau Senang was actually ideal for it to become a penal settlement. It was idyllic and scenic, right? So in the spirit of rehabilitation, it was nice to actually have this kind of environment around the prisoners. And nothing can describe what this feels like to a hot and tired man. But Pulau Senang suddenly became an island of terror. Really very shocking, the level of ferocity within that short amount of time. There was no discussion, no talk. They just uh, rushed in and slaughtered him. This was a gangland murder. Gangland do not kill people at random. It is a dark blotch. Human beings are capable of good, they're capable of terrible evil. Session number 2490, interview with Mr. Jimmy Chu, Group 5. Could you tell us something about how you eventually became a prison warden? When we were in Utrung prison, they established a prison in Pulusanang. The settlement is from a barren island. After a, a few months, they have dormitory, they have a power station, they got vegetable farming. It was really surprising after, after one year, so much has been done. And the prisoners are free to roam over the island. Could you tell us something about the, the riot and what happened after that? Hmm. The news reached our prison headquarters. So the commissioner, James, came out to the prison and said he wanted a few officers to accompany him. So we took our arms and we went together. We reached in a speedboat within 20 minutes. And I was the first person who witnessed Mr. Dutton's uh, body. He was burned like a lock, a burned lock. Hmm. It's a pity. I don't see any eyes because uh, maybe his eyeballs are already burned, you can't see. The warden one was just a few meters away from him, lying down. I think he must be hacked by something on his forehead. There was a lot of blood flowing. The whole of his office was burned. The living dormitories were all burned out. And it's like a war zone. He said, I trust the prisoner, you know. He said, they dare not do such thing as right. You know, he has too much trust 
who were his prisoners. Hmm. Singapore in the 1950s was undergoing a profound transformation. It was leaving a colonial past behind. It was turning to a point where it was able to self-govern. Secret societies were definitely an ongoing problem. They had always been present, but by the 1950s, there was a general consensus that secret societies were out of control. I grew up in 1950s Singapore. During that time, secret society was a menace. We had gambling, prostitution, drugs. The secret society managed to instill fear into people. Victims dare not go to the police stations for fear of reprisals. And corruption within the Singapore police force was at its peak. From the top to the bottom, everybody was on the take. The numbers were quite huge. There were 120 gangs and there were up to 20,000 gangsters in this country. For a small place, that's amazing. So the British government introduced the Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Act to take action against gangsters who they believe had committed acts of terrorism or made threats towards the people. The Act gave the authorities special powers to detain these people without trial. It contributed to the prisons being overcrowded because you're detaining many suspected uh, criminals, but you are unable to bring them through the entire legal process. So in that sense, the prisons really began to uh, feel the strain of this ordinance. There was the awareness that the prisons, uh, the Outram and the Changi prisons were overcrowded and the living conditions were poor and inhumane. And out of that actually came Senang. So one of the uh, proponents behind Pulau Senang uh, experiment was Devan Naya. Devan Naya was an idealist. He also had a, a tremendous view of humanity and human beings. He thought even the worst members of secret society can be improved and sent back to society. My father, Devan Naya, was one of the leaders of the anti-colonial movement at that time. He was also a political prisoner in the 1950s in two different spells. He developed an interest in prison rehabilitation uh, with a view of rehabilitating them and incorporating them back into society instead of just punishing them. Now, after he was released from prison in June 1959, my father persuaded the government of the day to establish a commission on prisons. And one of the ideas for the prison reform was the creation of a model prison like Kulapsana. And that's the genesis of the thing. Pulau Senang was chosen because it's one of the southernmost islands that was part of Singapore. We are told that there are shark-infested waters, so escape is very, very difficult. The currents are very strong, and so it would be safe to use that as a penal colony. You have an island where the detainees were free to roam around the island without any kind of fences, any kind of barriers to keep them away from others. You also have a situation where you didn't have that many number of guards there. They weren't even carrying firearms with them. The experiment would actually require these detainees to help set up the infrastructures that they needed to survive on the island itself. It's goodbye to the harsh, enclosed walls of Changi Jail as they set off for an unknown life on a lonely island a few miles from Singapore. So when they first landed in May of 1960, it was pretty much virgin territory in the sense that it was all jungle. 
they couldn't stay overnight because there's absolutely no facility. The man who was handpicked to run Pelau Senang as superintendent was Daniel Stanley Dutton. Dutton arrived on the island with 51 detainees. Dutton was a Brit. He was someone that worked within the prison services, so he was familiar with Singapore's uh, corrective services. He was also involved in the Malayan emergency. He was a figure who was well regarded. He was seen as a strong believer that if you worked hard, uh, you would be able to rehabilitate yourself. He wanted to try something different. These are not petty criminals, no. He took the hardcore ones because he wanted to show that reformation can change a person. He don't even allow his prison officers to have a weapon. That is how much he believed in his system. He wanted to prove to everybody that I can do it. I can change these hardcore criminals into a good person. You just watch and see. Dutton spoke a number of local languages, including Malay, Hokkien. Uh, he's married uh, to a Malay woman. Also, he's someone that has community connections. He's someone who really had a vested interest in seeing Pulau Senan succeed. Dutton was a very unusual prison officer. He was often talked of as a person who could build anything with his hands. He was very inventive. He was a ground-up type of person. His superior described him as a natural leader of men. Dutton was given a free hand to select uh, whom he wanted to bring along. And uh, bearing in mind that he had to develop the island from scratch, he consciously selected people with certain skills whom he knew uh, would come in handy. These detainees, they're criminals, they are gangsters, they are prone to acts of violence, perhaps murders, and the fact that you were bringing them to an island and giving them tools and saying, now let's work on this project together. I do find this quite remarkable. This whole idea of Senang, this whole idea of this experiment was a national effort. This was a big project. I think they were convinced that Senang is going to be a transformer. It was a good idea that if people have gone astray, less made them good. I mean, what's wrong with them? This is morality, this is humanity. Uh, let's try to correct someone rather than keep punishing them. It's like medicine. It was a penicillin of some kind. Unfortunately, it didn't work. Daniel Stanley Dutton is my half-brother through having the same father. I have a, a photograph taken of Daniel. He was about 18 years of age, taken on a march through London. And it does show a very confident young man, ready to take on almost anything that was thrown his way. 1952, the family had a word that Daniel and his wife, Vicky, were on their way down to Southampton to catch a boat to Singapore. And could they pop in and see us? And uh, being only 12, I was quite taken by uh, the two of them. Vicky was a very pretty, lovely lady. Uh, she was Malay and had a flair for design and fashion and uh, went on to great notoriety within the fashion industry. Daniel, uh, I did shake hands with him and I felt as if, uh, as if I was looking at uh, not only a relation, but, but quite an important man off to do a job a long way away in Singapore. And that was the last time that I saw either Daniel or Vicky.
the initial few months of the Pulau Senang experiment really see detainees working at um, a tremendous pace. It was an amazing thing that they did because they had to tame the jungle and, and then uh, make use of the raw materials there. So Dutton arrived on Pulau Senang with 51 detainees. Within that first year, the number of detainees increases, so you have around 120. And they build a substantial amount of the infrastructure. Dutton was there on the ground, mobilising, moving. He would work as hard as his men, which, of course, attracted a lot of respect from them. In the early days when they hadn't built the dormitories, he was sleeping in close proximity to the detainees. And it speaks to the idea that he had developed a rapport and that they were working on a shared project. And these detainees really supported the vision that he had for Pulau Senang and the type of settlement that they were creating. Although it was very, very hard work, they realised that life would be better than the alternative which would have been a, an extremely overcrowded Changi prison with all the squalor that would go with it. That's quick work. The job's speeding up now, partly because they're all getting better at it, partly because the end's in sight. So the progress was so amazing that even the United Nations took notice and there was a film that was commissioned about the progress uh, on the island, which was you know, widely broadcast uh, and uh, was even shown in cinemas. So that gave an indication of not only the success that was felt locally, but also drew the attention of criminologists and policy makers the world over. Hey presto, there's light. The United Nations was particularly excited about this project because there had been open prison experiments in the UK, in the US and in Europe, but this was specifically a project to rehabilitate uh, secret society members. The detainees all seem very young in the film. This is partly because those who were detained under this uh, ordinance were generally very young people. In effect, this ordinance meant a detention without trial. So you have young men who have perhaps lost their way and that they are given a chance to rehabilitate within a couple of years and return uh, to society uh, to be able to find uh, employment. Something else that stood out was this idea that from nothing, from a jungle, you could build a modern settlement. I think that is very much a story of Pulau Senang, but I think it could be a larger story if you think about what Singapore was trying to achieve in this time. We feel pretty sure that most of these men are redeemable. Singapore was leaving behind the colonial past. It was turning to a point where it was able to self-govern. So there was a lot of impetus for the government to look at transformation and how to bring Singapore on what would become this sort of great journey of the third world to first world. Well, what do you know? I did it myself and never touched a brush before. Dutton and his team just stunned everybody. Nobody had imagined that these detainees who had hitherto been loafing around in Changi were capable of doing something like this. And it fired up a lot of hope. Uh, among the, the authorities because they thought, wow, if Dutton can achieve and accomplish so much with this group who were, you know, classified as hardened criminals, imagine what else could be done. And then the great day comes for one happy young man, release. And so he goes in gratitude for being given back his dignity as a man. There were over 300 former detainees who were released back into society with very few incidences of uh, being repeat offenders. So can you count that as a success or not? I would say yes, in some measure, what Dutton tried to do was successful. We all want to believe and we want to see how we can turn people around. And so this was a pioneering effort. 
can't remember how many times my father took trips to Pulau Senang. Obviously, he thought it was a success. He felt about that. It was an experiment that was worth undertaking. On this beautiful island is one of the most successful penal experiments anywhere in the world. Here's no Devil's Island or Alcatraz, but living proof of the free and creative labour in pleasant surroundings as the means of rehabilitation of the hardened offenders against society. My father knew Dutton because my father was a political detainee in the late 1950s. So when Pulau Sunang was established in 1960, I'm sure he would have been consulted on the appointment of Dutton. I have a vague memory of a tall man who greeted us when we visited. You know, my father would have tea with him. The relationship trust was such that we were brought there and my first swimming lesson was from by one of the detainees in Pulasana. It's very difficult to, uh, to know what's in the hearts of, of men. The chap who could look after children is the very same person who in a fit of rage, is capable of murder. I think Dutton was a man of the moment. He inspired confidence. There were obviously those who liked him for what he did, who thought that he was doing the right thing. Daniel's rise up through the penal system was quite dramatic, and his belief in the task that he had to fulfil was absolutely paramount. And he was awarded an OBE, Order of the British Empire, the second highest award that can bestow in our British society. A very high award, and uh, they don't get handed out lightly. Almost like a Victoria Cross, really. I think Daniel's drive was immense. Many of the prisoners realised what Daniel was trying to achieve, what his role was. They needed a very strong head uh, under which uh, his rules would have to be obeyed. The case was vast. There were reports about detainees being asked to work at night because it suited the timetable better. In some cases, they were asked to work beyond regular hours because uh, a project was deemed urgent. I think this would be alarming. Although Dutton believed that he was working side by side with these detainees in a shared and common project, the power that he wielded would have been a source of fear and frustration. Over time, the dormitories had been built, the canteen had been built, roads had been laid. Why was Dutton still pushing really uh, long working hours and being really demanding? celebration. The media that followed the establishment of the penal settlement was actually almost all positive. You would have all these people who are celebrating this new revolutionary idea that they had where they could actually rehabilitate these detainees uh, more effectively. And then you also had all this show of ministers going onto the island saying that they were really impressed with what was going on. And this was good for the detainees. Time has brought other changes. In their gangster days, they were sworn enemies. But sweat and toil have brought them together as friends. 
Yes, real friendships are made. The only voice that was speaking up against the whole project was David Marshall, who was a minister at that time. David Marshall was a very remarkable man. Uh, he was a Jewish politician. He was primarily a lawyer. He was a first-class lawyer. So David Marshall went down to the island and um, he was unhappy with what he saw. He thought that uh, there was an aura of fear pervading the island, that somehow the detainees were living in constant trepidation about their fate. He also reported that he thought the conditions bordered on slavery. This was in April of 63. They start work from scratch, just like pioneers. On the day he visited, he mentioned that it was extremely hot, and yet many detainees were involved in extremely arduous physical labour. These were not convicted criminals. These were, in fact, detainees who were being forced to work. David Marshall uh, always believed that, that they should get a fair wage because, in his mind, they are not convicted criminals, so you don't make them work as punishment. You can't punish them for that because they were not convicted. So you should at least pay them a fair wage. Marshall was the loudest voice to challenge the government's uh, perspective. But he did not challenge everything. He thought the whole idea of rehabilitation was good. He thought re-education was good. However, he still believed that they were being treated very badly. He was talking about sullen faces and uh, that not all is well in Senang. David Marshall's concerns really spoke to a disquiet he had about the project. He tried to raise it with the Legislative Assembly, but it seemed that no one paid attention. You do wonder if David Marshall's concerns had been given closer scrutiny that perhaps the events which took place would then not have happened. Singapore Song 我在那個醫院裡面窗口看到都外面,左右看到。呀! Bao 
เรียบร้อยเรื่อยๆชงไหลชงชีพทำบางชีพชงแล้วก็ได้ในรมหาเจ้าออฟฟิศเชียร์เลยหาเจ้าสั่งอะไรอีเยี่ยนมาเลยเพราะอะไรนะสุโฮมเห็นสินจังฟังขู่ขันชูชีร้อยสุดกัดละเหมือนเล็บสุดเป้าต้นเหมือนใจจงเจนตาเห็นจุดพิษปลักปลาก็สันสู้คนจงตัวอยู่到最后，他们就退了。那个比利公，警察对比利公公公公当面，公到最后转弯那个干路完见那个，打针了，他都 OK 了，他都不折，全部舒服，很多好啊。那个门嘣，他跑出来，他叫很大声了。有的时候，他们还在那边打架，后面。要不，那个他第二的学校，他带队，带一队十多个人。My father, John William Gilford, who was attached to the prison service at Pulau Senang. People rioting, detainees throwing this, throwing that. You got no weapon, you got nothing. Why don't you go into one of the buildings and hide? My father would say, you expect me to run away? Then I fought in India, I fought in Burma. What is a war compared to this riot in Singapore? On that day, uh, I don't know who came to pass a message to my mother, and that is when the panic started. Daddy is in trouble, and there was a problem in Pulau Senang. Nobody says what was the situation. That go to the hospital and wait because he will be transported back from Pulau Senang to the hospital. Said that he was hit on the head, his arms, legs. He was unconscious for one month. My mother was there, just waiting, not knowing whether he will come through, whether he will 
feel? How were we going to survive? You know, uh, a woman with four children, the afterthought of what is going to happen. And after that, it came to a point when he lost his memory, and that was that. My father, after coming out from hospital with the loss of memory, he couldn't tell what was actually happening. It's for the good, you know. Um, can't remember anything. What if he remembered everything? So, in a way, I'm happy he couldn't remember anything. Uh, leave it at that, close the chapter. Danny Dutton, he was Vicky's love of her life. Vicky was devastated. When the news came in, they brought the body back to Singapore. When they were doing the washing, the Muslim burial, the washing of the body had to be done very gently because of the burns. Seriously, she was crushed, okay, crushed. I think such a tragedy when he was murdered on Pulau Sanang because that fairy tale came to an end. Vicky Dutton was a designer, she was a model, and she was a writer as well. She was very comfortable to be in the public eye. And you can see that in the way that she carries herself in these images that she's in. Vicky Dutton was constantly accompanying her husband in societal events, and she was a darling of the press at the time. I think she was very much aware that all eyes would be on her. And I guess trying to see how she was going to react to this very unfortunate incident. And I think there was this idea that she had to give answers to questions um, that she did not possess herself. The shock of the burial of Dutton. 500 people attended that event. There was a clear attempt to demonstrate if you are an officer of the state, you will be honoured in life or death. I think the message from that funeral was he has done right and he has died in the service of the nation. And I think the emotion uh, expressed by Wiki uh, just merely added to the entire atmospheric of what happened on that particular day. There are these very interesting images of Vicky at the funeral. And there are all these close-up images of her um, at his grave site. She is pictured in distress, kneeling down. But I think that you know she held uh, her own to the end. I think this is really how she was able to show her support for her husband. It must have been a lot of public pressure um, and she must have had to live with this gloom over her as answers were sought, um, as deductions were made.
There was an expose written just after the riot, and I think this would have been quite shocking for the public to read this because for the first time you're having accounts of the type of unrest which had been occurring on the island. It would have been quite a revelation because there's mention of attempted escapes, an attack of an attendant, one of the attendants on the island. The expose pointed to an altercation. 14 detainees had been working all day in the heat and they had asked for water which had been refused them. The request was give some water to because of the work they were doing and the water was not given. How can you not give water to your workers when they are working in hot sun? So when they were still being forced to work, one of the detainees attacked uh, the attendant. Then the other detainees also uh, joined this, so the 14 uh, actually attacked him and then fled into the jungle. In fact, they needed to call in the reserve unit uh, to make sure that they could restore calm to the island. Was it a warning sign that there was greater discontent on the island? The event with the 14 rioters uh, could have been the first hint of something much larger to come. One of the interesting men of that time who was actually in Changi prison, but also spent a very brief time at Lao Sedang is uh, Neville Tan, who had this notorious name called the Iron Man of Changi who was really a very high-status criminal law detainee. So what was the general feeling when the prisoners knew that they'd be going to this island, Texas? Some of them were quite excited because they were told it was not going to be like a prison. It was going to be uh, like a kind of a detention island. So they were told that they would be you know, get, getting different privileges, uh, special food, and their main task was to develop the island. I remember the first few trips, some of them came back who were sick, medical attention. Uh, they were actually saying, oh, it was very nice. A quick look at Pula Senang, and they know one thing for sure, there's going to be nothing Senang about it for them. Then the reports came back, it became worse to worse. And uh, then the reports of the brutality came in and things like that. He would be there, supervising the work, shouting away, cursing and yelling off. I guess he was the typical example of a slave driver. You either do it or you get punished. The complaints were always overruled. There was always this fear that if you did complain, unless you get off the island, you could add it. It showed his belief system that I can be nice to them. You do good, I'll reward you. But if you disobey me, I will teach you a lesson. became a talking point in coffee shops, among hawkers, among dry shore riders. I believe most of them wanted 
such a pilot scheme to succeed. So people were shocked in Singapore. They speculated on the reasons. They spoke ill about Dutton and his colleagues, whether anger was slowly building up, and it just exploded. There had been rumours that the detainees had worked out a hit list of um, those that they wanted to see punished. And, and this maintained um, Dutton as the top of that list and then many of his guards as well. This was a gangland murder. Gangland do not kill people at random. They will kill people who have been targeted. So these were people targeted by the gang the crown in the jewel was Dutton. At the end of the day, what did he do to provoke people to eventually do what they did to him?